Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Thompson. I am a uh, visiting professor at the Haas School. Uh, I teach, uh, actually team teach ethics and responsibility in business through the evening and weekend MBA program. And I am delighted to welcome you to uh, 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 a very uh, inspiring, interesting evening tonight with our Dean Speaker Series. Uh, I'm excited to welcome our very special guest, uh, Senator Jeff Flake, uh, who will be uh, chatting with us this evening. Um, I'd like to share just a little bit about him. Um, um, author of the New York Times bestseller, Conscience of a Conservative, a Rejection of Destructive Politics and the Return to Principle, Senator Flake has taken a lonely stand for principle and civility in an era of hyper-partisanship. After serving six terms in the US House, House of Representatives, Senator Flake was elected to the United States Senate, where he served for six years. While in the Senate, Senator Flake chaired the Subcommittee on Privacy, Technology, and the Law. He also chaired the Africa Subcommittee of the Foreign Relations Committee, where he passed landmark legislation on wildlife trafficking and democratic governance. Uh, prior to entering Congress, Senator Flake served as Executive Director of the Goldwater Institute in Arizona. He also directed the Foundation for Democracy in Namibia during that nation's transition to independence. Uh, Senator Flake holds degrees in international relations and political science from Brigham Young University. Uh, he is currently a contributor to CNN. His guest lectured at Princeton, Yale, and Stanford. Was a resident fellow at Harvard University. Uh, Senator Flake currently lectures at the Marriott School of Business at Brigham Young University, as well as at Arizona State University. And uh, Senator Flake and his wife Cheryl live in Arizona and Utah, and are the parents of five children. Um, on a personal note, I've had the great pleasure of getting to know uh, Senator Flake personally at my home institution at, at Brigham Young University. And uh, you're in for a treat. I found him to be the most um, courteous, unpretentious, and earnest politician that I've had the pleasure to meet. Um, whenever I have spoken with him about his experiences on the political firing line, uh, he somehow left me feeling more optimistic about the future of this nation. And so I'm, I'm very eager for him to share his insights with you tonight. Senator Flake, we're so glad to have you here with us this evening. Hey, thanks for having me on. It's good to be with all of you. So in, in terms of our format tonight, um, I've been asked to conduct a little fireside chat with Senator Flake okay. as part of the evening. Um, and then we're gonna open it up to some student questions. We have a handful of those questions queued up and ready to go. Uh, time permitting, we may open the floor to other questions. So. If you wanna use the little Q&A feature and uh, pose questions as we go along, uh, if time permits, we will take some of those and we'll plan to wrap up by 7 p.m. So Senator Flake, uh, to start off, I'd love to have you share what drew you to a career in public service. What propelled you in this direction? <laughs> Well, when I'm asked that question, I usually say only half jokingly that I wanted to, any job where I didn't have to milk a cow anymore. <laughs> I, I grew up on a on a ranch in northern Arizona with 10 brothers and sisters. And uh, anyway, I, I wanted to do anything but that <laughs> when I was a kid. Uh, but I, you know, the, the truth also is my father was uh, the mayor of our hometown of Snowflake, Arizona. Uh, small town. Um, my uncle Jake Flake from Snowflake, if you can believe it, was uh, the Speaker of the House in Arizona for a time. Uh, I had an uncle who was the President of the Senate. So I, I saw, you know, public service around me and my family, and I was taught that it was an honorable profession. And, and I saw it practiced by people who, who really weren't partisan at all, uh, you know, at the state and local level. You don't see the partisanship uh, that you do at the national level, and uh, you know so it, it it drew me to it. Although I have to say that I I didn't know that I would run for elected office until about a year before I did, and so I, I went through half of my career uh, long before I thought I'd run for elected office. I just knew that I enjoyed politics. I enjoyed being around uh, public policy uh, more than anything. So that's what kind of drew me to it. Thank you. So um, 
uh, obviously a, 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 a long and interesting uh, uh, career in the legislative branch. What, what were the most gratifying aspects of your time in Congress? And uh, maybe you could pepper that with a favorite experience or two. Well, that's a great question. I, as, as I mentioned, I enjoyed the, the policy aspect of it. I ran a think tank for about seven years prior to entering Congress. And uh, in the House of Representatives, uh, I, I came in with a lot of vim and vigor. I was going to cut the federal budget as a good conservative wants to. And there was a, a process uh, called earmarking that uh, unfortunately I think is making a comeback uh, where individual legislators uh, you know, can basically claim part of the, the uh, appropriation bills as their own. And it, it had gotten out of hand at that time in the early 2000s. And it was a very corrupting practice. Uh, a couple of my colleagues ended up in jail um, over the practice, uh, one for collecting campaign contributions in exchange for earmarks or you know, local projects, or two for accepting money uh, straight under the table uh, for this kind of spending. And, and I, I, I came in uh, wanting to change that practice and uh, ended up spending a lot of my time uh, as a House member, a young House member, going to the floor of the House of Representatives and challenging these individual spending uh, projects. And I didn't have much success uh, you know, challenging them on the floor. In fact, I, I challenged several hundred uh, earmarks. So introduced legislation to block that several hundred times and won just one vote, uh, one vote that entire time. But uh, I kept at it and, and over time, these individual spending items became less popular and more difficult to defend. And so perhaps one of the most gratifying uh, times was when uh, we, we banned the practice. Uh, first, uh, Speaker Pelosi, when, when she was in earlier, uh, this was after 2006, uh, banned earmarks for private companies. And then later, uh, John Boehner as Speaker, uh, Republicans moved to ban earmarks completely. and. Uh, and they've been gone. Unfortunately, I think they're going to come back in some form or fashion. And uh, I, I don't think that's a good move, but, uh, but we'll see if they can keep them in check. But that was, that was perhaps one of the most gratifying. And then in the Senate, uh, I, I did a lot more foreign policy. I enjoy uh, doing foreign policy work, particularly with the continent of Africa, where I ended, uh, spent uh, part of my youth. And, uh, and then I also had some crazy notion that we ought to uh, allow Americans to travel wherever they want to, as long as there's no compelling national security uh, reason not to. And, and that led me to challenge our policy toward Cuba. And uh, in that, uh, I, I was able to work uh, across the aisle. Uh, I found a lot more support on the Democratic side of the aisle for my position than I did among my own party. Uh, but, uh, but to be able to work on that issue and ultimately uh, to see under President Obama uh, us establish diplomatic relations with Cuba uh, and to be able to fly down uh, and raise the flag over the U.S. Embassy for the first time in 54 years, that was, that was pretty gratifying. Well, those are, those, those are great memories, I'm sure. So um, an, an Arizona farm boy uh, finds himself in Washington, D.C., full of idealism. Um, and uh, in addition to these great things you've talked about, uh, you encounter some some polarization that we're seeing in national politics that I think arguably are more pronounced than they've been in a long time. Um, how do you make sense of of the state of polarity in our federal government at, at this time? And um, I'll ask a follow up question after you address that. Yeah, I, I, you, got, you know we. we, we, we it's, it's a po always popular to say, oh, it's worse now. There was the golden age uh, before and whatnot, but the, you, can, you can even look at politics uh, empirically and, and say that you know, we've never had a time when so few politicians are willing to reach across the aisle. And you can look, you know, like I said, empirically and, and look at vote counts. And uh, we just see very little of it these days. Uh, when you, uh, you know, are in a legislative body, whether it's at the state level or on a city council um, or you know, at state or federal level, you're expected to, uh, to compromise. You're, you're expected to try to persuade 
the other side to come to your side of the agreement uh, or argument, but then ultimately uh, you rarely get everything that you want. And we've seen it uh, you know, more difficult. Uh, for example, when I was in the House of Representatives, uh, we Republicans adopted something uh, called the Hastert rule. It wasn't an official rule, but what it said basically is Republicans would not put anything on the floor while we were in charge, while we had the majority, that couldn't be passed just with Republican votes. And, and that's, a, that's just not a, not a good way to legislate. Um, you, you're, you know, Republicans will rarely have a massive majority enough, uh, certainly like 60 votes in the Senate, which requires, where you're required to, to pass a filibuster or get past a filibuster. So you're required to compromise. That's what is expected. But we've seen less of that. And we've seen a lot more rancor as well, where crossing the aisle or working with the other side um, often uh, is, is not just frowned upon by your own party or primary voters, but it's sometimes accompanied by death threats. And uh, and I, I you know, was on the baseball field uh, being shot at <laughs> um, at times. And so it's, it's, it's become... Uh, far more polarizing than it should be, and I, I hope we can get out of it. Would you, uh, and, and uh, uh, if you allow me to ask something a little personal, uh, I've heard you talk about that experience on the, on the baseball field, and uh, I think our students might be interested in hearing about um, you know, what, what that moment was like. Well, yeah, this was uh, we were practicing for the Republican or for the uh, congressional baseball game we have once a year. I played in 18 of them uh, during my time in the House and Senate. And uh, although it's Republicans against Democrats, it's very much a, a bipartisan affair. We raise a lot of money for for uh, kids in the D.C. area. And, and so it's something we look forward to every year. This this year, and it was 2017. We were in our final practice as Republicans for the game the next day, and and uh, you know right near the end of practice, uh, somebody yelled "shooter, shooter," uh, and several of us were on the infield uh, getting ready to do batting practice, and and um, you know a gunman uh, opened fire. Um, Steve Scalise, uh, our second baseman, who happened to be the uh, um, majority whip in the in the house, was hit uh, and crawled into the outfield and collapsed. Several of us, uh, myself included, dived into a dugout. And then for the next eight minutes, uh, waited while you know, bullets uh, you know, raged around. Uh, uh, and then Capitol Police uh, obviously engaged and returned fire, but we were kind of in the middle of it. But uh, I remember, um, when you ask what I remember about it, the thought that I had, I remember when I turned toward the dugout to run, uh, was, you know, what's he doing? How could somebody look at a bunch of middle-aged men playing baseball and see the enemy? And, and that, that's the thought that really stuck with me. It just, uh, uh, you know, how, how could that happen? Uh, fortunately, uh, everyone on the field survived, uh, Steve Scalise. Uh, as soon as this gunman was shot and he, he ended up losing his life, uh, I ran out to Steve and used my batting glove to plug the bullet hole in his hip. And uh, he was able to survive until, you know, first responders got there. But it was a, a terrible scene. And, and that's not the only one. I, I was reminded, I just uh, did an op-ed uh, for USA Today yesterday with Gabby Giffords, uh, my colleague from Arizona who was uh, shot. Uh, while holding a, a town hall of sorts uh, in a parking lot. And uh, uh, that same kind of thought as uh, driving down to Tucson to, to be with her, uh, is how could anyone, you know, look at, at uh, you know, somebody or a group of politicians and see the enemy? And that's kind of where we are now is uh, we see the enemy. And I, I just one more, you know, bringing it to current day, uh, Liz Cheney, uh, who is the Republican uh, whip, um, I'm sorry, not whip, uh, she's a Republican conference leader, so in leadership among Republicans, but she happened to vote to impeach uh, President Trump uh, over the January 6th insurrection. Uh, and so she has not been a popular figure uh, among 
a lot of Republicans. But uh, when Joe Biden came into the State of the Union, uh, you know, the, the joint session of Congress two nights ago, uh, she gave him a fist bump. And uh, she's been you know, blasted by other Republicans for doing so. And, and her response was, I don't often agree with Joe Biden on policy, but he's not my enemy. Uh, we come from different parties, but we are all Americans. And uh, it's tougher to see that now. Um, and, and social media in particular, with that backdrop, it makes it even more difficult to, to uh, you know, to reach agreement with the other side or for, to find any incentive to do so. Sorry, long answer to a short question. No, it's great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you're, you're no stranger yourself to incurring wrath and uh, you uh, were, were willing to stand in opposition to your own party. Um, I, I'd love to hear you just reflect on um, how, uh, what, what gave you the confidence to take that sort of stand and how do you deal with the personal toll of of uh, standing for your values when it's maybe unpopular on both sides of the aisle well the way i always looked at it uh, uh, there it's great to be a member of congress uh, to be in the house and to be in the senate it's a heady experience and uh, you know it's there, there's a lot to be said for it but there are also a lot of sacrifices that you make uh, and most especially your family. And, and, you know, for me in Arizona, you know, flying to Washington uh, 30 some weeks of the year and leaving my family behind and uh, um, in particular, my wife, you know, had to deal with a lot. And so my thought was always, boy, if I'm going to be doing this, I better be accomplishing something. <laughs> I'd better be standing for something uh, because if I'm not, if I'm just back there to, to mark time, uh, then it's it's really not worth the sacrifice, particularly for your family. And so that when it came to you know whether I should uh, as a Republican and as a conservative uh, go along with uh, with you know policies that I didn't think uh, were conservative, and to you know, basically justify behavior that wasn't proper and and uh, that I'd stood against. Um, my entire life, uh, it, it just, uh, I didn't think I was doing justice to uh, either my own principles or, or my family's sacrifice. And so th for me, uh, when it came to you know, whether I would support the president's policies or condone his behavior, uh, I just couldn't do it. I, I would have liked to have maybe stayed another term in the Senate, uh, but I knew that uh, in doing so, I would have to ultimately be on a campaign stage uh, with the president, uh, who would ridicule my colleagues, uh, who would uh, make fun of, uh, of people in my state, uh, largely minorities too, and uh, and I'd have to look at my shoes when he, uh, you know, when he said these things, you know, on the campaign stage, or laugh at his jokes, and I couldn't do it. Um, and so there came a time where uh, you know you have to decide. Is this what I can do, or or is it not? And uh, that's that's why I chose to to stand and, uh, and uh, say what I thought was right, uh, and be able to be in the Senate for two years after I decided, almost two years after I decided uh, that I wasn't going to support the president. Um, and uh, yeah, you come under a lot of criticism, but but you do what you think is right, and I thought that was the right thing, and I still do. Thank you, Senator Flake. Uh, you know, we're, we've got a room full here of, of students who are um, uh, in, in the midst of careers or preparing for careers when they're going to be called upon to stand up occasionally for things that are unpopular. Um, it's easy to talk about doing that in the ethics classroom. It's a much different thing when you're looking your colleagues in the eye and uh, taking an unpopular stance. I, I'd love to hear you just reflect on what advice uh, you would give to our students here about preparing for those difficult moments when standing for your values is going to incur a personal cost? Well, I would argue whether it's in business or in politics or whatever endeavor you're in, just look at the long game. Um, look at uh, you know how you want to be viewed, what you want your legacy to be. Um, 
and uh, if if you do, uh, you know, it's it, it it makes you act differently. I think um, if you're just looking as a politician, I could speak as a politician. If you're just looking at the next election, what do I have to do uh, to keep uh, the voters with me? Uh, what do I have to do to to get past a Republican primary uh, or a general election? Uh, instead of, uh, you know, where do I think the country ought to be? What kind of country do I want to live, leave for my kids and my grandkids? Uh, looking at the long game just makes you act a little differently. Uh, politics is politics and everyone, uh, like I said, makes compromises. That's, that's part of the game. That's part of what you do in politics. But you, there are certain core principles that you ought to hold and say, I, I there are places I can't go, or there are things that I won't do. There are words that I won't say. Um, and, and I think if you'll just remember that, uh, like I said, whether you're in business or, or politics or, or any type of public service, whether it's elected office or not, I, was, I admired so much uh, those people who uh, the former president would call part of the deep state. Uh, but, uh, but frankly, those uh, federal uh, uh, part of the federal bureaucracy or election officials or others who who stood up and uh, and did the right thing when there was a lot of pressure uh, not to and so it's it's not just those in elected office that are faced with these kind of decisions uh, if you're in public service uh, in any form or in business you're going to be faced with uh, these kind of dilemmas and uh, I, I say just look at the look at the long term always. And uh, that'll that'll change your your perspective. Thank you. That that's such a that's a wise response. Um, you've been devoting a lot of time and attention to uh, civility and um, uh, public engagement at more of a local level. And I, I know these same polarizing tensions we've talked about are resonating in the lives of our students. I'm reading it in their papers. They're dealing with these ideological rifts in their own family, their own communities, their workplaces. Um, what advice do you have? What path forward do you see for our students in their sphere of influence to foster more civility uh, in the midst of all of these debates? No, that's great. Uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, as as an official, elect, elected officials, you. you you obviously read Twitter. <laughs> you you look at social media, whether you say you do or not. You do, and and you're influenced by it. And uh, you know, it, typically on social media, it's for every uh, positive comment, there are ten negative, and and you understand that. You've come to understand that. But boy, I, I whenever I talk to students or anybody who's thinking, what can I do to change the situation? Is is just make sure that you model good behavior yourself. And uh, when you engage on social media, and we need people to do that, uh, you know, the inclination sometimes is I'm just going to stay off. Um, I'm just going to stay away. But we need people to engage, but to do so in a positive way. Uh, just a, a couple of examples, maybe. I, I've been, as I mentioned, very critical of the former president and his use of uh, sometimes quite vulgar language to talk about uh, uh, people in public service, elected officials and, and others. And uh, so after the midterm elections in 2018, a, a Democrat was elected uh, who uh, in an unguarded moment, I guess, uh, that was caught on tape, used very vulgar language to talk about how the president ought to be impeached and whatnot. And and so I, uh, I thought since I've been critical of one side, I ought to be critical of the other. And I, so I, I said, as elected officials, we ought to model better behavior. We're better than this. Um, over the next uh, two days, there were 30,000 comments on my, my, uh, tw my tweet. Um, I was what you call ratioed. When there are more comments and there are likes or, or uh, retweets, then you've been ratioed. Uh, but not all 30,000 were the same, but the vast majority of them said uh, something like the following, you know, if the president speaks this way, then so must we. And, and that's the problem. If, uh, if we don't have people willing to model better behavior, then everything simply escalates. And so the advice I, I would give is, uh, is to 
to not uh, you know say anything that uh, you know you wouldn't want your mother to see, um, and 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 you see it uh, unfortunately come back to bite a lot of people. Uh, there was uh, a woman who was nominated for the head of office of management and budget or OMB uh, named Neera Tandon, and she was forced to withdraw her nomination. Um, this was a cabinet level office. Uh, because of tweets that she had uh, that she had sent out uh, years before uh, against some senators uh, who would then have to confirm her for this position, and not enough of them were willing to do so. Now she had actually come after me <laughs> on a few of these tweets, um, but I, I I felt you know she was certainly sorry for what she'd done, and I actually uh, not in the Senate but uh, supported her her nomination, uh, but boy, be careful uh, about how you use social media uh, because it will come back um, maybe to even impact your own career, but more than that, it, uh, it has an impact on the incentives that politicians uh, consider uh, when they make decisions. And so anyway, I don't know if that makes sense or not. But. Yeah, it does. Thank you for that, that advice and it's helpful for all of us. Um, so in the, in the midst of what I think we could safely call the mess, that is the, the national political scene, or at least it has been, um, the events of January 6th, um, a lot of harrowing things in our recent history, um, what, what gives you hope uh, for the future of democracy, for the, for the future of this nation? Uh, that's great. Great question. Um, I hope that uh, that politics becomes boring again. <laughs> um, I wrote a piece for the Washington Post a while ago where I said, you know, six months from now, what do we want to see? And, uh, uh, I want to see boring politics <laughs> and, uh, uh, where people will go back to watching football and The Bachelor or whatever else and not look to politics for for entertainment um, and and sparring. So I the, the, what I where I have a hope is that one, we have better behavior being modeled uh, now, certainly from the White House. Um, and, and not that I always agree with uh, Joe Biden. I'm from a different party. I have a different perspective on a lot of uh, his uh, policies, but uh, he is modeling better behavior. And so having that at the top helps. Uh, but uh, what really gives me hope is that uh, political pendulums swing wildly sometimes. Uh, but they do. And uh, when there's no market for a certain type of uh, politics or behavior, then politicians will reach a different conclusion and go a different way. And I, I'm speaking as a Republican. I don't want to make this partisan, but, uh, but I, I, I like our two-party system that served us well. But you have to have two parties that are grounded in reality, uh, that aren't trafficking in conspiracy theories. And uh, that will engage on policy issues and not so much, uh, you know, on uh, <laughs> conspiracy theories. Um, I, I'm saying that because in Arizona, we're still uh, right now. The Republican Party is challenging the election results from November still, and having to do a forensic audit of all the ballots in Maricopa County. So it's fresh on my mind here. Uh, but but ultimately, the voters said in Arizona, frankly, uh, we don't like that. And you can't go through too many cycles before politicians will recognize this isn't working. We've got to go a different direction. Um, it, like I said, it, it's, it's far more difficult to see civility and bipartisanship with the, the social media backdrop that we have. Uh, but I think it, it will happen um, because you, you'll have leaders who will stand up and say enough is enough. And, uh, and I'm seeing some of that. Um, we, we're in a better situation, I think, now than we were, uh, you know, six months ago or a year ago. And, and, uh, and I think that we're going to see signs on certain areas where if you have success on bipartisanship in one area, then it spreads. Um, and we can do some other things as well. So hopefully with some of the legislation being proposed, uh, uh, we can uh, work together on that, and then that'll spread to other things as well. And, and I should say as well, we're also seeing, uh, you know, after the horrible situation with the George Floyd killing, 
uh, last year, you've had, I think, 140 pieces of legislation uh, passed nationwide in state legislatures, sometimes uh, cities. Uh, police departments are policing differently. Uh, and, and for the most part, uh, that's been a bipartisan exercise at the state and local level. And so if we can do some of that at the, the federal level, then, then I'm more hopeful. Thank you. I, I appreciate that, and I, I've uh, I, I've loved hearing you talk about the state and local level and the opportunities for you know real real bipartisan gains there. Um, and those are the things that uh, that our, our students maybe have uh, the, the most easy access to become involved with. Um, well, I think it's time now to to open the floor and hear from some of our students who prepared some questions. I think first up we have uh, Zinia Ilani. Uh, Zini, if you're uh, available, I'll let you go ahead and pose your question. Yes. Hi, Senator Flake. To begin, thank you so much for, for joining us today. We appreciate you being here at Berkeley. Um, question I have for you is during your time in public office, what was the biggest leadership challenge you faced? And what has kept you going and motivated in the face of adversity? Biggest leadership challenge. Uh, well, I, I think the, the most difficult one, uh, obviously, when I got to the Senate and uh, and I had a situation where my own party, uh, I was in disagreement with uh, with the head of my party, um, and that uh, you know it, it becomes difficult because you are under pressure um, at home and among your colleagues to stick with the party, um, stick together. And, and that, that's the most difficult decision you make as a politician, uh, whether you're uh, willing to, to stand up. And usually, I mean, my own view is that uh, politicians can get away with a lot more than they think they can in terms of, uh, of, of the voters being with them. If they'll stand up and say, hey, uh, Here's, uh, here's what I really believe. And let me just give an example. I, I, you know, part of the reason I went to Congress is because some issues I felt, uh, you know, really were uh, impacting Arizona and needed to be solved. And one of those is immigration reform. And uh, my party, the Republican Party, wasn't too keen on some of the kind of uh, reform efforts that I was engaged in. Uh, you know, comprehensive immigration reform, uh, it was often called amnesty because uh, I was willing to, uh, you know, have some way to deal with those who are here undocumented to give them a path to citizenship or to deal with the dreamers um, or to have more liberal uh, visa programs. Uh, and, and I received a lot of pressure at home and had a couple of primaries uh, from people coming from my right. Um, and, and that, those, those pressures are always there. But like I said, if you conclude that I'm, I'm here as an elected official to do something, uh, to move policy in the right direction, uh, then uh, it's, it's worth it. It's worth taking the arrows and it's worth uh, standing up uh, to your own president, uh, to your own party, um, if need be. Now, ultimately, you, you may face a situation where you simply are out of step with the voters in your district. Um, and I certainly found myself out of step with that subset of a subset of a subset, <laughs> Republican primary voters uh, in the end. And, and I would have had to change my entire uh, you know, position and uh, um, really who I was if I was you know, to be able to pass a Republican primary uh, in 2018. <laughs> and so sometimes you may feel I'm just not there, but most times uh, leaders can uh, move and educate their voters. Um, that's, what, that's why we have a representative democracy. And, uh, and that's, that's uh, what I think too few legislators are willing to do because the easiest path today, I can tell you the easiest path and what people are incentivized to do is to Whenever a big issue comes up, whether it's climate change or it's policing or it's uh, immigration reform, is to rush to your tribe and to state where you are and don't indicate that you might be open to persuasion or education 
whether you might somehow change your mind, because as soon as you indicate that, then you're hit from both sides or all sides. And it's easier to just say, I just want one side mad at me. And, uh, and that's the calculation that uh, too many people in politics make today. So uh, I don't know if I, that answers your question or not. Answered, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Inya. Uh, let's hear from Lishan Chen. Yes, uh, thanks for taking the time to speak with us, Senator Flake. Um, I'm a first year at uh, in the evening weekend program here at Haas. Uh, many of us will be future leaders employed by the social media companies that you mentioned uh, when we graduate. So my question is, what do you think are actionable steps that we can take to mitigate the problem of hyperpolarization brought on by the attention grabbing 24 new uh, 24 All right. Well, that, that, that's an excellent question. And uh, I, I, uh, I feel for those who are in positions uh, of trust, uh, frankly, with the social media companies, the big ones are Facebook and Google and, and all the others. And I know most of them and have worked with them. And, you know, for the most part, uh, frankly, I think we're trying to uh, find a balance here and trying to do the right thing. And I, I'm, I'm not one of those that uh, uh, goes out to criticize every you know, head of a, a big uh, media company or a social media company, because every time you think you've struck the right balance uh, between you know, free speech or, or uh, whatever else is on the other side, or uh, it's always been a struggle between freedom and security that we as politicians will try to strike. As soon as you do, then new technology comes along that uh, you know, blows it all up and you have to do it again. So I, I think the, the key is to, to go in with the right frame of mind, whatever company you're, you're gonna work with. And to, I mean, I, I think we all know that, that what goes on or what is allowed uh, on some of these platforms is not good for the country. Uh, but we also know that, uh, that we can't simply go and, uh, and cut off the free speech of people that, uh, that want to express themselves politically. So like I said, striking that balance and just going in with the right attitude is, is all we can do because every time we think that anybody who says they have the solution uh, to how Twitter ought to handle, you know, uh, Donald Trump, now that he's an ex-president, or, I mean, you, you just don't, or mediums will change and platforms will change and we'll be faced with uh, this rebalance again. So the key is just to have the right principles and know what's good for the country and, and try to do what's best for, like I said, your kids and your grandkids who will, who will have different platforms uh, but social media is with us. I mean, we, we're not going to go back to the time where people simply, uh, you know, read the evening uh, newspaper that was delivered or the morning paper or watched uh, one of the three networks. We're, this is here to stay. There's some form of it. It'll just be different platforms that evolve. And so uh, the key is to, to say what's best for society as a whole. Um, and we've seen other, we can view other countries as they try to deal with it, more authoritarian countries, and we don't want to go that direction either. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, those in your position and of your age uh, to figure this out. And then once the technology changes to figure it out again, uh, because that's what we're going to have to do. And, but I can tell you that, that politicians, um, are usually you know, way behind on the technology side. I, I remember the hearing we had with uh, uh, the first big one that we had with Mark Zuckerberg. It was a joint uh, commerce and judiciary committee hearing. And uh, one of the late night comics uh, said later that night that six of the senators who were posing questions uh, and, and were spouting off on you know, how to handle this technology, he said, six of their passwords, uh, uh, email passwords were still password. And so it, 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 it pointed out in a humorous way how behind most politicians are, particularly those uh, of uh, you know, 
a vintage age. I mean, and you have the average age in the Senate is still pretty high. Thanks so much. Thank you, Lishan. And uh, as we move on, I'll just uh, I'll point out to echo Senator Flake. I mean, um, uh, interacting at a university with young people like Lishan who are headed toward leadership is one of the reasons I have hope for the future and for better things. I'm sure, Senator, you probably experienced that in your tours of various universities as well. Um, uh, let's hear from uh, Dan Bernstein. Yeah, thank you, Professor Thompson. Thank you both for uh, taking the time with us tonight. Just a quick intro. I'm a Kingsford, Kingsford sales leader by day, a Haas student by night, and ultimately a substantially underdressed individual to be asking you guys a question tonight. But nevertheless, right. Senator Flake, you, you had a relentless commitment to your values, and I love your advice about playing the long game. You know, a lot of us here are in our MBA journey, and we're either forming uh, or revisiting our purpose and values. So what I would love to hear from you is how did you form your values and ultimately how did you get such conviction behind them? Well, I, I, I think uh, my upbringing, like I said, watching uh, my, my dad and uh, my aunts and uncles uh, serve and to see public service as an honorable uh, profession and, and something that I wanted to go in uh, with that in mind, I think was was one part of it. But uh, as far as what informs your values, uh, you know, everybody has uh, a different thing. For me, uh, my religion uh, played a big part of uh, who I was uh, growing up and who I am today. So whether it's uh, uh, religion or whether it's your your own conscience um, or whether it's example of others. Um, you know, you, you go in the best uh, uh, politicians we have, or those that go in with conviction um, and principles, uh, but understand with legislative bodies, uh, we're there to get as much consensus as we can, uh, but to, uh, you know, to move public policy in a direction that uh, you feel it ought to go, but not uh, to, to view public policy you know, as a, as a cudgel or politics as a way to just uh, simply beat up on others. And uh, so I, that's, that's kind of how I've seen it. It's just, like I said, for me, it, it just wasn't worth the, the sacrifices that are made, particularly by your family. Uh, if you're going, going in to one, either just mark time and enjoy the perks of office or two to go in, uh, and use politics as a way to to simply one up uh, the other side, whether it's the other party or or uh, you know others. It's just uh, it's not worth it that way. And if you're playing the long game, um, you'll realize at some point, uh, you know, after you've served in public office, uh, whether that's elected office or or some other way, you know, you'll be home uh, retired uh, with your grandkids <laughs> and. Uh, and you think, you know, did I do the right thing? Um, you know, did I, was my time in public service or in business, uh, was, it, was it spent well? And I think that that, whether that's informed, like I said, by religion or, or, uh, or something else, that uh, the best politicians and the best uh, uh, leaders in business are those that have some convictions that they're willing to stick with and some, th some things they simply will not do, some places they will not go. Love it. Thank you for the for the response. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Jack Woodruff. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you both. Thank you, Senator Flake. Um, I've admired you a long time for your integrity, and um, I I view that I think most clearly in your your ability to change your mind. I, you, you spoke earlier about how hard that is in the political limelight. Um, I know, for example, you have an, an, you had an A rating from the NRA, but after those horrific events on the baseball diamond, you came out against high capacity magazines. Uh, and it's just one example. Um, I wanna ask you about some, some ideological political beliefs um, and if you've thought of them in any new light, you've done any reflection 
uh, after January 6th. You've described yourself as a supply sider with caveats. And I think your voting record very much bears that out as well. Mm -hmm. um, looking back now, do you see any relationship between that philosophy and all the tributaries to the events of January 6th? And as a follow-up, um, in your view, could an expanded public sector help all Americans feel more bought in to our country and therefore less susceptible and vulnerable to demagoguery. Hmm. Oh, we asked about uh, supply side uh, economics uh, with caveats. Uh, I, I, I think there are more caveats <laughs> than I wanted to admit uh, early on. I still believe the principle that uh, you know incentives matter in terms of uh, you know uh, taxes and uh, incentives. Uh, but uh, but obviously there are a lot of caveats, and I've uh, I've admitted there are more uh, <laughs> as we've gone along. But I, I I'm not sure that that I'm, I'm still a believer in limited government, and uh, and I do think that um, we're approaching and we've been frankly uh, uh, in a dangerous time um, with you know our public debt where it is, and and uh, whether or not uh, we are doing well by our kids and our grandkids by having such a massive public debt. If we could have a larger public sector uh, in certain areas and still not accumulate uh, the debt that we have, uh, then I might feel a, a bit differently um, because I, I, I'm not a conservative that views all uh, government solutions with suspicion or big government in all areas with suspicion. But I am uh, extremely concerned about where we are fiscally. At, at some point, at some point, we're going to hit a breaking point uh, where we simply are accumulating too much debt. Uh, so now, whether or not that's best solved by more supply side uh, type economics or uh, or something else, uh, but I, I am I am concerned about the equality gap and how we deal with that. I, I tend as a conservative to look more on the opportunity side and look more at some of the inputs, uh, uh, how we educate uh, uh, the population and what we do with our public education system and opportunities that we give um, than, than perhaps some on the other side of the aisle. But, uh, but I, uh, I, I don't know, looking at January 6th, if, uh, if you can point to uh, some of these things as a contributor. I think the biggest uh, contribution to January 6th were the actions of the president and people in my party uh, that were willing to go along with that. Um, and like I said, I, I wouldn't contribute that too much to supply side economics or, or, or conservative kind of economic policy because the president is not, or the former president is not much of a practitioner of it. Um, he, his, his ideology was just whatever uh, keeps me in office. Uh, so I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure, and I, I wouldn't go as far as to say that uh, my supply side uh, uh, leanings were, had much to do with January 6th, but, uh, but I, I'm certainly, I know where the blame lies and it's uh, with my former president and uh, my party. Thank you very much, very thoughtful. Uh, let's hear from uh, Farzad Yosefi. Yeah, thank you, Professor Thompson. And thank you, Senator Flake, for joining us today. It's great to hear from you. Um, a lot of great questions have already been asked, so hopefully I don't make you repeat anything. Feel free, feel free to skip. Uh, we're in Professor Thompson's ethics class, so I decided to ask about uh, ethics. Um, I see our extreme partisanship today in our politics. And I feel like this is discouraging almost um, unethical policy, or it's discouraging ethical policy making. Wanted to see if, if you agree with that, that we're getting to that point. And what are your thoughts on ending this extreme partisanship that I feel like it's a huge danger to our country? Um, you talked about you like the two party system, but could getting rid of the two party system be a solution to kind of ending such extreme partisanship? Well, I'm, I'm not, uh, I look around the world and see multi-party democracies, they have their own issues. Um, 
I, I think our system has is, is, uh, served us pretty well. I do think that there need to be reforms, uh, significant reforms, uh, election reforms. Um, I would like to remove uh, as much as we can uh, primaries uh, from being run by the parties. Um, I, I, for example, I'm very much in favor of what Alaska did with a, what they call the top four, uh, where Republicans and Democrats get out of the primary business and uh, the top four candidates move on to the general and then uh, ranked choice voting is used uh, you know, for the general. Um, that, uh, that I think uh, we, been looking, uh, several of us, at uh, uh, trying to do something similar in Arizona. We now have it in Maine and in uh, Alaska statewide, but that has many advantages. Um, in it, One, you have somebody like uh, Lisa Murkowski, one of my former colleagues, who, you know, having voted for the president's impeachment and uh, posing him on many policies and issues, uh, would likely not have a chance in a Republican primary. And so the incentive for her would be to, to if she wanted to stay in office, to go along uh, with the president and some policies that she disagrees with. But uh, given their system now, um, she's far freer to vote her conscience, if you will, um, or to do what she believes is right, because she can get to the the general ballot and do quite well, I think. I, I think she'll be back uh, in the Senate after the next cycle. So I, I, I think that that would help. So certain election reforms, obviously uh, the way we draw district lines for the Congress uh, needs to change. We in Arizona have uh, a better system than most states, but it still could be improved. Um, so I, I think, yeah, certain election reforms that would make our two party system work a lot better. Uh, right now, uh, boy, in Arizona, as a Republican who would like to see uh, some other Republicans elected, I mean, we have two Democrats representing Arizona in the Senate for the first time in over 70 years. And that will likely persist as long as, as my party uh, um, you know, is so far out uh, and extreme. And like I said, right now, still challenging the last election rather than saying, all right, here are some policy options where we can gain advantage over the other side. Uh, if we had a system of uh, you know, a final four and then a ranked choice voting system, and ranked choice has another advantage too. Um, if you realize that uh, you know, somebody can rank you either one, two, or three, you're a lot less likely to uh, run a very negative campaign um, because uh, you wanna be somebody's second choice as well. And so reforms like that, I think, can go a long way toward making our two-party system a lot better. Thank you. Thank you, Farzad. I think we have uh, one, one more question that's queued up. Uh, Stephen of Ortria. Yes, thank you, Professor Thompson. Thanks, Senator Flake. I have uh, questions, uh, a question I've had actually for a while as it pertains to uh, people in leadership positions, and that is the majority of people only get to see the public facing side of their elected officials. You've been in a unique position to get to know some of these people personally and understand them um, on a one-to-one -one basis. My question is how often do you see people uh, make statements or vote um, in a way that aligns with their, per their public persona, but not necessarily their personal one? Well, Stephen, that's a, that's a great, great question. Very perceptive. Um, you know, gratefully, um, you know, you, you look at the situation now, you look at uh, cable news and you see people sparring or with their press conferences and whatnot, you, you see them on the floor and you think they hate each other. <laughs> they, uh, these Republicans and Democrats, these leaders. Uh, but uh, I'm, I can tell you that uh, the situation isn't that bad. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's not as bad as it's seen. There, people do get along better, um, but there's just no incentive for them to do that on the cable news at night or on the Senate floor. Um, but there is, you know, things have changed in a way that, that make it less likely for people who would otherwise uh, feel incentive to agree or to work across the aisle than they used to. And it, it's often been said uh, in Washington that you 
Uh, you'll never question your colleague's motives if you know the names of his or her children. And it used to be that members of Congress got to know each other a lot better, just the way uh, our system was structured, because uh, you used to move your family back to Washington once you were elected and live next to, uh, you know, Republicans and Democrats living, you know, close together. Their kids would go to school they together and uh, and they would recreate and uh, and worship. Uh, on the weekends and you don't have as much of that. So the situation is more difficult, but uh, it, it, uh, it's still, still better than it looks. And uh, let me just say one, one example, when I got to the Senate, I was so uh, upset that we had changed the practice in the Senate where you used to have at least one, sometimes two lunches a week where Democrats and Republicans would have lunch together and just just the senators. And you had a lot better situation uh, at that time in terms of working together and, and whatnot. But then the leadership of both parties saw advantage to just splitting them apart. And so by the time I got to the Senate, Republicans would have lunch together Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Democrats would do the same. And uh, only once or twice a year would we come together. So Martin Heinrich, a Democrat from New Mexico, and I figured we'd uh, illustrate that Republicans and Democrats can get along. So during a Senate break in August of 2014, we marooned ourselves on a Pacific island. <laughs> Martin and I did. Uh, Discovery Channel came along and filmed it. <laughs> they called it Rival Survival. And uh, they still air it every once in a while in between episodes of Naked and Afraid. But, uh, but I remember coming back and uh, Stephen Colbert had the best uh, line. He, he said, Jeff Flake and Martin Heinrich prove once and for all Republicans and Democrats can get along if death is the only option. So uh, we, we've proved that empirically, that it can happen. But we, yeah, the, the situation is, uh, is tougher because there are fewer opportunities but I can tell you in the morning, almost every morning in Washington, when the Senate is there in the Senate gym, there will be Chuck Schumer on a treadmill next to uh, um, next to Cornyn and uh, Rand Paul will be in there and, and Ted Cruz, and Dick Durbin. And there there's some of that that goes along, but but less of it. And uh, congressional codels where uh, members travel around the world together. Some of that goes on, uh, certainly not in a pandemic, uh, but it's less than it used to be. So yeah, back to your, your question, it is better than it looks. Uh, and there are some things that we could do to make the situation a lot better where people, the trust level between Republicans and Democrats is there. If you trust your colleagues, and Martin Heinrich and I sponsored and passed legislation after that island trip together, because I, I knew that uh, I could trust Martin, that if we had legislation, that uh, he wouldn't use procedures when we got to the floor to include amendments that I didn't want. And he knew that I would do the same. So th that trust level needs to be there. And we just don't see much of it today. Sorry, that's a long answer to a short question, too. Thank you. It was helpful to hear. Thank you, Stephen. Great question. Thank you all. And uh, we have a lot of questions that are unfortunately going to go unanswered. The time has flown by. So uh, with, a, with a minute left, uh, Senator Flake, um, any parting words of advice you have for, uh, for these, these folks who are building their careers and looking to contribute? Uh, what, 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 would your, what would be your word of advice? Well, you're all you're doing the right thing. I mean, you're in a class like this, you're a mid career, many of you, um, um, you know, considering uh, what you can give back um, or whether you can, uh, you can go forward in a way, whether it's public service or in business and in, in ways that make uh, our country better. So you're, you're already where you need to be and uh, certainly are in a far better position than I was at, at, uh, at your stage in life. So uh, just, just keep it up and just remember, look at the long game. Um, you know, play the long game um, all the time. Uh, think about uh, where our, our country will be, uh, uh, what's uh, best for your kids and your grandkids. If you, if you do that, uh, then uh, you're happier um, and uh, the country's in a much better place. So, and enter public service. We need people uh, who, 
who understand that uh, that it's a noble profession and uh, to not uh, get in the habit of demeaning those, all of those who are in it. Obviously, you're going to have your bad apples and you need to uh, call people uh, into account uh, when that's proper. Uh, but uh, don't be down on the, the whole system. We have a good system of government and uh, pendulums, like I said, do swing and things will change. Majorities change and uh, always remember that. And one thing, uh, one pitch that I'll, I'll make, and it's a tough one to make now, but uh, uh, I love the Senate filibuster uh, because it is one of the few mechanisms left that force the parties to work together. And uh, it's, it's popular when you're not in the, in the majority uh, to, uh, or I'm sorry, when you're in the majority to, to diss the filibuster and nobody in the house likes the Senate filibuster because it's, uh, it's frustrating to pass legislation that dies in the Senate. Uh, but we want uh, a situation where legislation that's passed endures and where we don't have a situation where one party will pass legislation that as soon as the next party comes in charge, we'll try to undo it. And we just ping pong back and forth. That's not a good situation. So we, we've got to come to consensus. And I think you, you know, given the questions that uh, you had, you guys are on the right track. So anyway, get involved in public service. Thank you so much, Senator Flake. This has been a delight. And uh, students, it's good to see many of you again. I, I, I wish you all well. Thank you for your contributions. And uh, yeah, it's the long game. We'll leave, we'll, we'll leave with that ringing in our ears. Thank you, Senator Flake. Thank you. Thank you all.